This is Steve Hiles welcoming you to Episode 1 of the Teacher Rockstar Podcast, a place where tips and strategies critical to new teachers are discussed. In this episode, we're going to be talking about classroom expectations. Okay, so let's dive right in. What are your expectations of the first day of school? What are your assumptions about the people, place, things, ideas, and experiences? Our expectations and assumptions can make big differences in how well things go, both on the first day and throughout the school year. Your attitude counts. If you enter the classroom with the mindset of someone who assumes the worst, you may expect that the students will be noisy and difficult to control. And so they probably will be exactly that. On the other hand, if you are expecting quiet, well-behaved students who raise their hands to ask questions and remain quiet whenever you want to speak, you may be bitterly disillusioned. No classroom in the world is entirely filled with good or bad students. When your students walk into the classroom, how will you greet them? What will be their first impression of you? Will they think you are friendly or formidable, a wimp or a tyrant? That first impression can shape the whole school year, striking a balance between creating a positive relationship with students while retaining a level of authority and control can be a key to a teacher's success. The first impression on the very first day is critical. Consider how adults socialize when they make new acquaintances. Don't we take time to ask each other our names, where we live, where we come from? Don't we want to share information about our jobs? hobbies, interests, and our families. Maybe we have mutual acquaintances or have been to the same places. We may even have met before. Those initial conversations establish our connections and we take in a lot of information about each other. Nonverbal impressions communicate even more strongly than do words. Some social scientists estimate that perhaps 93% of all communications are nonverbal. We observe each other and gather thousands of subconscious impressions. Things like eye contact, body language, tone of voice, facial expressions, quality of energy in our gestures. These are just some of the ways we communicate who we are and what we gather as our impressions of other people. When you start planning for the first day of school, I urge you to put yourself in students' shoes. Think about the students' impressions of you. How will you appear to them? Young people are just learning to negotiate social roles, and many are very fashion conscious. Your clothes, hair, skin, and general appearance will tell them a lot, or they will assume they know about who you are. Now, even small items such as jewelry you wear can convey meaning. Do you avoid jewelry altogether, or do you load on the bling? One college professor became known on campus for wearing a colorful scarf looped through a solid gold ring every day instead of a tie. Long dangling earrings can become a distraction for students, but small pearl or gold studs can help students focus on watching your face. Check your body for points of tension. Are your shoulders tight? Your students will notice, I promise you. Do you look people in the eye or avoid eye contact? Do you stand tall and proud when standing in front of the class, or do you crouch over your desk when teaching? Now, whether consciously or not, humans tend to mirror others' postures, pace of movement, and other subtle physical behaviors. Do you want your students to be mirroring a tense, abrupt, jerky, trembling person or someone whose body is grounded, centered, calm, and strong but flowing? Think about the qualities you seek in your students. Consciously change your movements to suit whenever you have a minute to think about them. And practice releasing tension and increasing strength in your movements. As you would expect with your students, practice until what you want to convey comes naturally and automatically. Is your body open to students or closed? If you find yourself crossing your arms or keeping your hands in your pockets, think about whether it is a Uh, an appropriate gesture for the situation or whether you are defending yourself by closing off. Think about the scale of gestures you make. Do you make small, tight gestures that only can be seen from the front row? Or could you move in larger, more sweeping and flowing ways so that even the kids in the back of the room can see and sense what you are expressing? When do you feel your stomach clutch? 
do your hands sweat at times? Notice the things that trigger physical reactions in your body. The triggers can be many things, situations, people, events, ideas, tone of voice, etc. As you become conscious of your physical reactions and the triggers for them, consider what you would like to say with your body versus what you are actually saying to them. Are you calm, cool, and collected? Or frazzled, frantic, and failing? You are the role model for your students and very likely the only uh, adult that they spend the most time with. How you speak and move in a classroom has a powerful effect on their attitudes and reactions to you. Moreover, they will respond to and even emulate your physical and vocal expressions. In the best of all possible worlds, wouldn't you want your students to be able to move freely, speak clearly, think well of themselves, and be considerate to others? It is the small but crucial choices you make about your appearance that will communicate most about you in the early days. Now, in many private and religious schools, teachers are usually required to dress quite formally. In schools that require students to wear uniforms, there is normally a dress code for the teachers as well. However, through the U.S. within the public school system, dress has become uh, increasingly informal. Up through the 1980s, for example, American public schools com commonly set skirt lengths for girls, especially when skirts crept shorter than the miniskirt era. Girls in most schools were not allowed to wear pants, leading to frostbitten knees in northern climates. Many required boys to tuck in their shirt tails and cut their hair short. Severe punishments were handed out to those students and teachers who violated the school dress code. Still to this day, however, a number of U.S. schools cling to traditional standards for attire. This may even be mandated by the school administration. Now, this is not unusual. Elsewhere in the world, most government-funded schools require uniforms as a means of leveling social classes. Teachers everywhere are expected to be the models for adult clothing and behavior. Now, as a new teacher, whether you are fresh out of college or an experienced teacher moving from one district to another, you will be entering a new world. Each school has its own unique style, where in one school, a certain way of dressing is standard. In another school, that style might not be acceptable. The culture or style of a school is one of the very first things that you, as a new teacher, need to determine. Before taking the job, it would be wise to take a careful look at the school culture. Then it will be up to you to decide whether to modify your wardrobe and your behavior in order to fit in or to stand out. District or building policies may include standards for teachers' attire and appearance. Be sure you have investigated what will be expected of you. Now, let me be clear. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that one needs to go out and spend thousands of dollars on a whole new wardrobe. But what I am saying is that you need to dress professionally. In my opinion, now it's certainly my own opinion, blue jeans are not professional dress. I feel that blue jeans might be appropriate for things such as field trips, class picnics, spirit days, and field days. However, if your district and or teacher's union allows blue jean wear, then as a minimum, they should obviously be clean, pressed, and without holes. I mean, really, that should go without saying. I know for me personally, professional dress is a collared shirt with tie or a sweater combination, a nice pair of slacks and shine shoes. Dress to impress. You are the role model to these kids. You know, I've seen this happen many times over the years and it really embarrasses me. When I hear parents and or visitors in the building say that they cannot tell the difference between the teachers and, and the students because they, they all look the same. So my thing would be, is dress like a professional. Let there be no doubt that you are the teacher. Well, I hope that you found this information valuable. I do want to share one other thing with you. I am offering a free resource. It's my Let's Write a Book activity that I'm sure your kiddos will enjoy. It comes complete with templates and step-by-step -step directions. Your students are going to love creating their very own mini book. All you have to do is go to GetStartedOnTheRightFoot.com to download the resource. That's GetStartedOnTheRightFoot.com. 
Should you have any questions regarding this episode, please feel free to contact us at teacherrockstarpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for joining me today. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Until then, have yourself a great week.